this is yours. Oh, okay, thank you. So, so uh, my name is Michael Famiano. I'm from uh, Western Michigan University. Uh, when I left yesterday to come here, it was zero degrees, and um, I was really surprised walking outside this morning because I was doing this all the time. And I look at everyone else, and you have these big winter coats on. So it's it's interesting to see how people are different here. Um, so uh, I really appreciate the talk from this afternoon. It was uh, really a good coverage of, of several of the things that I'm going to talk about over the next few days. And it uh, uh, overlaps pretty heavily with what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so, so you people online, I do apologize. We couldn't share the screen because I'm not a presenter, but I will show you the link to these slides so you can follow along if you'd like. Um, so uh, let's see here. <laughs> okay, so so what I'm going to do is, is uh, Professor Carabini gave me uh, several hours to talk over the next few days, and so I'm going to try to cover some of these topics. Uh, if I don't get to the end, it's okay. Um, I'm quite free, I guess, to talk about what I'd like to discuss. And if you have any questions, uh, please, by all means, ask me. You can send me an email or ask me afterwards or ask me uh, uh, at any time during the, the course. Um, I'm gonna really start off with an introduction, then talk about uh, um, the course outline and the format, um, some, some recommended reading. And then uh, today probably we'll just talk about just some very fundamental things. I uh, uh, started off as a nuclear physicist by trade and over the years have become much more of an astrophysicist. Uh, today I do experimental nuclear physics but I also do a lot of theoretical astrophysics as well. And so we'll talk a little bit about that and how that fits into uh, this stuff here. Um, so day one is uh, is today. Um, some basic terms uh, should be at a, a review level and probably things you've heard about before, probably things you're quite familiar with. Uh, it's okay to review things. Um, and then tomorrow what we'll do is uh, um, get into uh, some experiments, uh, also probably at a, an undergraduate level, maybe uh, somewhat technical, maybe graduate level, but uh, should be pretty easy to understand by everybody. Um, day three, we'll also talk about some experiments and how those experiments relate to astrophysics, uh, particularly some of the experiments I do. I will say that uh, I am biased uh, in this series of lectures towards my own experiments, but please ask about other experiments. Um, please feel free to interrupt and ask about those. Um, if we have time, I am gonna talk about a special topic that I have been working on. Of course, I will talk about it next Wednesday as well. Uh, somebody asked a question during the past lecture about the origin of life. It's really interesting that, that there are connections between the fundamental physics and, and the origin of life, either on our planet or possibly in other systems. And of course, you've all heard about exoplanets in the news. There's a big search for signs of life on those exoplanets. By the way, how is my uh, voice? Can you hear me in the back? Okay, good. Okay, and then um, if we have time, we'll just catch up a little bit, uh, um, uh, do some special topics, maybe have some additional time for questions at the end, okay? Um, this course is, is going to be uh, primarily the lectures and slides, um, lots of questions and discussions, uh, some recommended reading. Uh, uh, the level of the course um, is not too mathematical. I don't expect a lot of mathematics over the next uh, couple of days. Occasionally, I will show you some equations and explain those equations. Um, if you have an introduction to calculus, if you know some calculus, we will talk about that. Um, you don't have to know calculus, but if you have taken a calculus course and you recognize how to do an integral, we'll spend some time discussing that. Um, what I expect from you is, is uh, please ask questions at any time. Uh, it's always fine to interrupt. Um, yes? How can we know if uh, your presentation are biased toward, towards your work? I will tell you. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I will say this is something I have been working on. Yeah, great question. Yeah, I'm not biased towards a, a particular theory or a particular ver variety of physics, but um, I'll tell a little bit about some of my experiments. Um, feel free to contribute to the discussion. If you need me to slow down or speed up, uh, please let me know. I, I will say, uh, shamefully, I, I only speak a few words of Italian. 
and so I have to speak in English. Um, um, uh, and it's okay to ask questions if you need me to clarify something. Um, one nice thing about this is, is uh, um, I, we, we can go as fast as we want to and we can cover topics that we want to. So if there's something else you would like to discuss, please feel free to ask. Uh, I have prepared things, but uh, we don't have to talk about those things. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not, um, I don't have that big of an ego. Here's some recommended reading. Um, this top book here is a very good book. Um, it's probably one of my favorite books on nuclear astrophysics. Uh, fairly complicated book, but also very good. Um, uh, this paper here um, is also very good. Um, this book here uh, talks a lot about experiments and experimental devices. And, and then um, a little bit on experiment at the end here. Uh, you don't have to write all this down, and I will tell you why. If you are interested in getting these slides, you can get them online. Uh, you can follow along if you'd like. Um, you people who are on video here, um, there's a, a, a URL, tiny uh, a web page at the bottom, uh, tinyurl.com, WH7ASP3D. Um, uh, probably if one of you want to text it to the rest of the class or email to the rest of the class, that would be good as well. So, okay. Give you a minute to write that down. Give you a minute to... Uh, Take a picture of that if you would like. Yeah, just turn the video. Yeah, Probably yeah. they will see from home. Yep, yep, yep. Let's take a look here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Probably at home you can see the page at the bottom. Because I'm looking at you here. Oh, okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. Okay. And if you can't get those, let me know. It should be there. And I will put more up as we go along. Okay. Let's get down to business. Let's get down to business. Yes. Nice American phrase there. Let's get down to business. Okay. Uh, we're just going to go some, some basic terminology. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about elements in the cosmos, specifically how we measure them. Uh, today's lecture will be a little short. Uh, we'll end about 6 or 6.15. And so we'll probably get through this lecture. Maybe we'll start a little bit into the next one. Okay. Um, we're going to go over some nomenclature, talk about elements. You've all seen the table of isotopes. You've probably seen the, uh, uh, excuse me, you've all seen the uh, chart of the elements. You've probably seen the table of isotopes. Um, we'll compare the two, why we use one over the other. We'll talk about nuclear structure, how we measure abundances of nuclei, uh, atomic masses, mass excess, things like binding energy. Uh, the goals are, are just to reduce some basics here, just to understand, okay? Um, and um, we'll introduce some of the format of future lectures. I really like this picture. This is probably the reason why I got interested in studying astrophysics. Um, this is a, a picture of the, the size scales of the universe. Okay. So you see uh, humans, humans down here. Uh, um, we see uh, humans live sort of at, at the 1 to 10 meter size scale. We understand what 10 meters is like. We know what one meter is like. If I told you how far from here to that door, you could probably say. You would not say 1,000 meters. You would not say one meter, but you, you have a good idea, okay? And this is orders of magnitude. But the universe covers many size scales. We have way down at the, at the Planck's length, theoretically the smallest thing we can possibly measure, okay? That, so you think of that as almost the granularity of the universe, 10 to the minus 37 meters. Most of my work, at least in, in, in um, plasma physics, which I'll talk a little bit about, about next week, covers 10 to the minus 17 meters. And then if you work in nuclear physics, your work covers 10 to the minus 15 meters. This is a very popular length scale in physics. 10 to the minus 15, uh, uh, we call that a femtometer. Or um, uh, probably over here, you call it a Fermi. Uh, same distance scale here after the famous physicist. Um, then, uh, you know, biology tends to work at 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 9 meters. There's a, a, a micrometer or a micron. Uh, when you start to get into things that you can see, 
Um, you can probably see if you have really, really good eyes, you can probably see maybe 10 to the minus eight meters, roughly the width of a human hair, uh, um, little less than the width of a human hair. Um, and then as you start to get into uh, um, centimeter, uh, centimeter type scales, and then uh, one tenth, 10 centimeter type scales, um, the chart actually goes like um, goes like um, this, okay? And and then uh, this is one millimeter. Of course, humans live here. Then as we get to things that are larger than humans, um, 10 to the four meters, that's ab about, about Catania, the size of Catania, <laughs> all right? And 10 to the seven meters, okay, that's, that's how far you would have to go to go from, say, Catania to, to, to where I live. And, and then these scales go all the way up. We're zooming out the universe. Could, could be about 10 to the 27 meters. I'm going to talk about why we know that and how we know that the universe is that big. So, so take a look. Um, that, that's 64 orders of magnitude in length. Yes? Are you more fascinated by the lowest scale or by the highest scale? Yes. <laughs> that, that's a great question um, because because what, what I hope to do is by the end of the week show you that this scale can be related to to these scales here. So so, so that, this is all of astrophysics. Yeah, yeah, they're they're going to link to each other. The the talk I'm going to give next week, which uh, Professor Carabini talked about in, in the previous lecture, is going to relate. Um, this scale and this scale, uh, as well as say uh, this scale here, which is quite interesting. It's actually more difficult to relate this scale and this scale than it is to relate this scale and this scale. And so I'm going to convince you um, that they're related, I hope. Um, and then probably what I will convince you of at the end of the week is that I don't know anything about this. Okay. <laughs> Very it seems a bit weird. It does. It does. Yeah, it's, and, and it's quite fascinating too. Um, but 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 that's why we like to do it because of the weirdness. Um, but there's another order of magnitude that I'm particularly interested in, and th and that's time scales uh, in the universe. So so the W boson. Um, remember uh, the previous lecture? He he talked about those bosons. Um, he showed the standard model. There was a W boson there. That's how long weak decay may take, how long it might take for, for a particle to undergo beta decay. And that's something like 10 to the minus 25 seconds or something like that. Of course, in our everyday life, we're pretty familiar with, with how much one second is, okay? Um, the, about a heartbeat or, or so, more or less, right? We, we have a good idea of that. We don't really have a good idea of what 10 to the minus 25 seconds is. And then as, as we go off, we, we have a pretty good idea of what a day is. We, uh, uh, you know, humans sort of live, live here. Um, at, at my age, I have a pretty good idea of how long a human can live. Uh, at your age, you probably don't have a pretty good idea of that yet. Wait till you get to be my age. When you get closer to this, you'll understand that. Okay? Any day now for me. OK, and, and then we get up to the age of the universe, 10 to the 17 or so seconds. And so, so the time scales that we study span, um, you know, 10 to the minus 25 to 10 to the 17, 32 orders of magnitude. Very interesting. Most of my work in nuclear physics really takes place at around 10 to the minus 15 seconds. How, how long? A nuclear reaction takes. In fact, we call that nuclear femtoscopy. Okay. Um, however, uh, a lot of my work takes place up here as well because it takes that long for elements to diffuse through the galaxy. It takes that long to build the Earth, which is built out of elements. Okay. So you've all seen this, right? Periodic table of the elements is something you know about. Something you, yeah, you probably saw in grade school at one point. Um, chemists love to use this. 
Uh, I'll be honest with you. I, I learned it in grade school and I forgot about it. <laughs> Me uh, too. You too. Good. We're, we, 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 are, we are like brothers then. Uh, you, you kind of know how it works. You kind of know that you know, this, is, this might be a closed electronic shell and that might be a closed electronic shell. What we do in nuclear astrophysics, of course, is, is we really want to know where these came from. We know that they exist. We want to know where they came from. These colors on this table mean something different. Let me show you this table colored a little differently. Okay, take a look at this. Um, this colors the elements based on where they came from. So uh, this was uh, this is actually uh, taken over by NASA. But if, if you look at it, you know, we've got hydrogen and helium up here. All the hydrogen in the universe Okay, came from the Big Bang. Okay, um, it's never never gonna, um, you know, you, you see a hydrogen molecule, you know, it came from the Big Bang. What we're really saying is, is protons were formed in the Big Bang. Okay, um, then helium. You get up to some of these more exotic elements, the the, the elements that you don't want to eat. The, these ones uh, um, came from more exotic processes. You probably heard about. Uh, who here has heard about neutrons, the neutron star mergers in the news or in classes? Mm -hmm. Two neutron stars collide and all that matter splashes out into space. But how have we discovered these elements? Um, neutron stars. Oh, how have we discovered the elements yeah. or how have we discovered that they are formed? Mm, the second one. Yeah, yeah, good question. I'll talk a little more about that probably later today, maybe tomorrow. Okay. And let me say this, some we're pretty sure about. Some, it, it's still an argument. So, so, so terbium. Yeah, terbium, for example, we, we think for the most part was formed in merging neutron stars. And we're getting closer and closer to the answer. Okay, but maybe it might have been formed in supernova large mass of stars that exploded. And the question really is, is, is how much terbium in the universe, for example, came from neutron stars? How much terbium came from exploding stars? Uh, we do have a separate lecture on that as well. Okay, uh, hope, hopefully I'll get to that. It's really complicated, it tends, to, tends to get complicated. Question? Uh, just a question. Yep. John, why dwarfs uh, snuff uh, instead of exploding like massive stars, like supergiants? Uh, can you ask that again? I say, uh, John, why dwarfs mm -hmm. or dwarfs in general snuff instead of uh, instead of like, literally exploding? Okay, so so, so for like, example, uh, fading out uh, in the time mm -hmm. slowly, slowly, slowly. Yeah, uh, great question. So so why would it be a white dwarf instead of something else, or why why can't it just be all white dwarfs, for example? Yeah, because I knew white dwarfs that turned into like a brown dwarfs, uh, something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, what this? Yep. Uh, what what is uh, the white uh, dwarf? Uh, what? I don't know how to spell it. White uh, dwarf. 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 Yeah. Yeah. What, what's a white dwarf? A dwarf, right? <laughs> okay. That low. You're okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I learned a little bit of Italian now, too. So. <laughs> At least I think Bianca means dwarf. No, Bianca no. means white. I know, I'm kidding you. <laughs> <laughs> dwarf is like a man that low. I, okay. I, 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 know, I know enough Latin anyway to at least get, get Bianca. But, yeah. but uh, I'm glad you get the American jokes. So. And by the way, um, take a look at the title, the title is very important. The, the, the origin of solar system elements. In order for an element to exist in the solar system, it has to first of all be made, and then it has to be inserted into the solar system as the solar system or before the solar system has formed, okay? An element that's in a star is going to stay in that star, unless that star somehow ejects it out into space. And that's what makes it really interesting because now there's a, a time that's involved to make an element in a star. A star lives its life. It might explode, inject those elements into where our solar system is, and then our solar system forms. So that can, that's a very complicated study. 
people spend their entire lives doing that. You see lots of scientific papers on that. Yes? Are there some theoretical reasons why the Knetsum or Promethsum are not considered? Um, can you say that one more time? Are there some theoretical uh, reasons why the elements of Technetium and Promethium are not uh, conceived? Um, th these ones here, you're saying? The one white. Uh, uh, and and oh, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about Technetium in a minute. What, if, let me ask you, what do you know about Technetium? Uh, yeah, we, we don't have it on the Earth, right? We don't have it in the solar system. Okay. Uh, it's radioactive. It has a, a fairly short half-life. We use it in, in medicine because we can inject it into people and um, it can stay in the person and then go away. And so those were probably made in stars, but uh, they decayed long before they um, entered our solar system. Yeah, great question. Uh, good eye, by the way. Good eye. Te technetium and promethium. So the table of the elements is... Um, pretty good if you're a chemist. Um, if, you, if, you, if you like nuclear physics like me, you need to take this one step further. You need to really expand this into another dimension. And so in nuclear physics, we use something like this. Table of the isotopes. Uh, who knows what this is? Who's seen this? Who can explain it? Yes. No. Oh, you're scratching yourself. OK. That's what you get for moving. I saw it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, in the x axis, there is the number of neutrons, mm -hmm. while in the y axis, there is the number of protons. So, in this way, we can see isotopes and maybe the way in they decay or do not decay. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, this is how we uh, look at uh, um, individual isotopes. Um, by the way, if, if you do a Google search for uh, live chart, L-I-V-E-C-H-A-R-T. It will bring you to an interactive table of isotopes here. Okay, so you know how many protons does carbon have? No, to be honest. Okay. Oh, can you repeat, please? How many protons does carbon have? Six. 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 Right. Carbon is on this row in this table. Six protons. Mm -hmm. Oxygen has eight. Oxygen is just above it. Okay. Iron, nickel region are up here, 28. So each row is an element. Now, a trick question how many neutrons does carbon have? It depends. It depends, yes. You can have different numbers of neutrons and it still be carbon. So the number of protons is what defines the element. Okay. Um, because elements, stable elements anyway, uh, non-ionized elements have the same number of electrons as protons. And when we talk about an element, we really mean how many electrons it has. We're really talking about chemistry, okay? Because the chemists deal with the electrons, the atomic orbitals. In nuclear physics, we deal with what's in the center of the atom, the protons and neutrons. So it depends is the correct answer. Carbon can have any number of any number of neutrons, or it can have certain numbers of neutrons, All right? Carbon-12, for example, has six neutrons. Carbon-13 has seven neutrons. Carbon-14 carbon has eight neutrons. And so on this chart, we show not only the number of protons in an isotope, but the number of neutrons. Does anybody know what these black squares are? Stable, stable, yep, stable isotopes. They, they don't decay. They're the ones that you will see probably around you all the time, okay? Um, this room, by the way, has some isotopes that are unstable, okay? We'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, in my laboratory, I use unstable elements in the room, in the atmosphere, to, to um, calibrate some of my equipment, okay? Uh -huh. Yes. I have a question, a question about that uh, straight line uh, in the graph. It's like a linear regression. I call that uh, it is the element uh, in, the, in the table uh, for chemistry. Is this right? The, yep. the normal periodic table of elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so question is, is what is this straight line? Yeah, yeah. Um, the straight line is just a line that's drawn on the graph. Um, <laughs> but, but it's important. 
this is a line where n is equal to z. Okay, number of neutrons equals number of protons. So you can see carbon 12, six neutrons, six protons. Oxygen 16, eight protons, eight neutrons. But as we get to more heavy elements, what can we say about the number of protons and neutrons? Um, more neutrons and protons. And why is that? In order to stabilize the uh, In order to stabilize them, yeah. yeah. This is, what, by the way, what we call the valley of stability. These are stable. These are the stable elements. Why do stable elements have more neutrons or fewer protons? The mass is greater. The mass of neutrons is greater. Okay, you're getting close. Yes? Nuclear force. Uh, the nuclear force is part of it. It's actually not the nuclear force, but it is a force. If I wanted, if I had an element and I wanted to add a neutron to it, I put a neutron on it. If right? you have less protons, you have less repulsion. So that's it. That's it. Yeah. The Coulomb force, right? Yeah. Coulomb repulsion. That's exactly it. Positive charge, positive charge. If I want to add a neutron to an element, I'm adding something with zero charge onto something with positive charge. If I want to add a proton, I'm adding something with positive charge onto something with positive charge. I got to push it. I got to do more work. And so the stable elements have fewer, or the heavy elements have more neutrons and protons just because it takes more energy to assemble an equal number of protons. How much energy does it take to put an element together, to put an isotope together? Okay. Yes. What's that ladder uh, that goes uh, along the linear regression and also the curve? Like there's, uh, there are many These steps dotted the lines? Yeah, I'm going to talk about that later on. Um, I will tell you what they're called. They're called. So why that graph squishes down at the end of the table? Yeah. Oh, oh what, what, why it goes yeah. like that? Yep. So, so you asked two questions. Um, first of all, what, what is this? These are just dotted lines here. So there's one at 6, 14, 20, 50, 82. Uh, I'm going to tell you what they're called and you're going to laugh. Those are called magic numbers. Okay. <laughs> Um, we'll talk about why they're magic. We have a magician here. We got a magician. Good. If you can figure out how to do this trick, you will win a Nobel Prize. Okay. <laughs> now, why, why does it get narrower here? Um, a lot of times, these are, are, are this is an incomplete table. Okay. The number of uh, uh, elements or isotopes may actually go out even farther. Many times when we draw these, this is just the isotopes we have discovered. Okay. Um, or we know exist anyway, okay? Also, when you build up an isotope, an isotope, by the way, is an element with any number of neutrons. When you build them up, you're, um, it always takes energy to build it up bigger and bigger. At some point, they just become unstable. We're not sure what the stability is way out here. Other questions? Okay, all right. Um, I thought I had a slide. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to show that one yet. I thought I had a slide for how we express these. So let me just write it on the board here. Um, there's a, uh, some numbers that we use to, to describe an element, to describe an isotope. By the way, when I talk about isotope, you'll sometimes hear me use the word nucleus. You'll sometimes hear me use the word species. What that means is just a different square on this plot here. Okay? There's one isotope here. There's one nucleus here. There's one nucleus here. There's different species. Okay? Um, we use the letter Z to denote the number of protons. Um, we use the letter N to denote the number of neutrons. And we use the letter A to denote the number of baryons. What is a baryon? Protons yeah. and neutrons. Yep. Protons and neutrons, right? So that's going to be equal to Z plus N, right? When I express an element or an isotope, I will write it like this. Probably you've seen this notation. Yeah. The um, element name here, so that's the element name. 
and the number of baryons in it. This actually will tell me how many protons are in the element, right? Because if I say carbon, you know Z equals six. If I say oxygen, you know Z equals eight. So for example, I will say carbon 12, I could say carbon 13, carbon 14, things like that, okay? They all have six protons. This has a mass of 12, so it's got six neutrons. This has a mass of 13, so it has seven neutrons. This has a mass of 14, so it has eight neutrons. So they differ for the number of the neutrons. They differ by the number of neutrons, yep, yep. And, and, and of course, by the, the, the mass, right? How many protons do we drop there? Yep, that's it. Other questions? Okay. All right. Let's say I'm. Let's say I'm in a star. Okay. Let's say I'm in any environment in space. But let's say I'm in a star, and let's say I I just cut out a portion of that star just so I can look at. Okay. I'm examining a piece of the star. Okay. That star may have all sorts of isotopes in it. I'm not exactly sure what it has in it, but it has all sorts of isotopes. One thing we do in nuclear physics is we try to measure how many isotopes are in that star. I want to know how much carbon-12 is in the star. I want to know how much oxygen is in the star. I want to know how much iron might be in that star. So there's ways I can do that. Let me show you some of the definitions that we use. And this is just a little mathematical. But it, it's good to keep in mind. Don't have to memorize this. Um, um, but you know the mass of an atomic species. So I know the, the atomic mass of carbon 12 is, is 12, right? Um, it's usually equal to the number of baryons. The mass of oxygen 16 is, is 16. And, and it's the number of grams per mole. Are we familiar with the term grams per mole? Kind of. high, high school chemistry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Already forgotten. You've forgotten? <laughs> Already. Old remembering. So yeah, that, that's okay. You don't have to remember. I don't remember either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> By the way, named after the famous uh, famous Italian physicist. Um, um, this is the mass of an atom. I take one atom. How much does it weigh? I take one mole of an atom. How much does it weigh? I take 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. How much does it weigh? Okay, how much mass is there? Right? If I take a, a, a section of space and it's got elements in it, it's got isotopes, right? Um, I want to know the number density. Okay? How, many, how many carbon 12 isotopes are in one cubic centimeter? Number of elements per cubic centimeter. Okay? Well, if I know that this is grams per mole and this is grams, I can divide this by this. I can do the dimensional analysis. The grams cancel out. And this gives me Avogadro's number. Take the, the, iso the, the um, atomic weight, divide by the, the mass of the actual atom, and it turns out to be Avogadro's number. This is how we define a mole. Okay? High, high school chemistry, it's been a long time for me. Um, probably been a while for you too, but this is our number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That's, that's what a, a mole is, right? Now, let's say I wanted to know what the density of my region of space is. So I take this region of space, I'm going to take one cubic centimeter of that region of space, I'm going to add up all the carbon 12s in there, add up all the oxygen 16s, all the nitrogen, everything. I know what the mass of all of them are, and that's going to tell me the mass per cubic centimeter, right? So this is just a, a sum up number of elements. I means an individual species, an individual isotope. So for I, I could put carbon-12, oxygen-16, whatever. How many carbon-12s are in there times the mass of carbon-12? How many oxygens are in there times the mass of oxygen? Add them all up. By the way, I could do some algebra here and make a substitution, okay? This tells me the, the total density of some region of space. How much mass per cubic centimeter? OK. Uh, familiar math, by the way, we're all we're on this. We're at this level here. OK, yep, good. Yeah. At this point, yes. At this point, yes, good. I can do some algebra, by the way, and, and take, take the density times Avogadro's number, and I'll get um, the, the, the total mass, the total 
atomic mass of a region of space. That's important because I can define something called the mass fraction. Okay, the mass fraction. If I want to know, if I have one kilogram of space, I want to know how many grams are oxygen 16. What fraction of that kilogram is oxygen 16? If I have uh, a kilogram of space, I want to know what fraction of that kilogram is carbon 12. How much of that is oxygen 16? How much is carbon 12? I call that the mass fraction. And what that is, is, is the, the, the number of density of, of, of one particular atom times the atomic mass of that atom all over this quantity here, rho times Na. And by the way, the, the atomic mass of an atom is, is roughly equal to its, its A number. And, and so this is a pretty good approximation. Let me ask you, if I figured out the mass fraction of every isotope in my region of space, I got, I got a kilogram of space. And you add them all? And I add them all, what am I gonna get? The total mass. The, to the, the total mass, right? But, 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 but this is normalized to, to what? One. To one, exactly. Yeah. Yep. You sum up all the mass fractions, you're gonna get one. Exactly right, okay? But just a curiosity, how do you say in English that symbol of uh, adding some, uh, some? Oh, some, some, yeah, yeah, some. Some, yeah. You say some for I, uh, what is the expression? Yeah, some over, so yeah, let me write that down. It's a kind of a mathematical jargon, right? So um, this means uh, usually, at least in English, we say sum over i, sum over i, sum over i. Yeah. Add up. Okay. 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 Now, now, sometimes I'm not interested in the mass fraction. So, sometimes I'm interested in, in what, what we call the, 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 the number fraction, or how many oxygen atoms there really are in, in um, a region of space. So I take this section of star, I scoop out a section of star, I have one kilogram, maybe it's got a mass fraction of oxygen of 0.2. But maybe I don't wanna know what the mass fraction is. Maybe I wanna know how many oxygen nuclei there are in there? How many oxygen 16 nuclei there are in there? For that, we use a different quantity. We use something called mole fraction or number fraction of some species. And to get that, I just take the mass fraction and divide by the atomic mass. If you remember the previous slide, it's the number fraction of that element times the density times Avogadro's number. By the way, this number here, is, is the total number of baryons per cubic centimeter. Total number of protons and neutrons per cubic centimeter. Okay? Um, so this is called the mole fraction. Sometimes this is called the abundance. In fact, you'll see it very, very often called the abundance. So, so you'll see this thing, abundance. Okay, same thing, call it the mole fraction. Um, this is nice to use because if my region of space gets bigger, the, the number doesn't change, right? The, that, 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 that's going to be, if, if, if I have a, a little region of space and I put it in a box and I make that box bigger, the density will drop, right? But, but the number of oxygen in there won't change. We like this too because this number is, is generally only changed by nuclear reactions. So if I have a nuclear reaction, it might change oxygen to carbon, for example, that will change this number. So we like this number quite a bit, okay? Um, you wanna be careful. Uh, the, this, is, this is astrophysics, um, which means we talk to astronomers a lot. I talk to astronomers all the time, and this still confuses me. Still, can astronomers use X and Y, and they also use Z, and they mean totally different numbers, uh, totally different things in astronomy. Any any astronomy um, 
people out there? Do you know what X and Y and Z means in astronomy? Azimuth, I don't know. Uh, I don't know either. <laughs> I, I was hoping you would know. I was just guessing. No, I, no, I was kind of, I was, I was really asking because I was hoping someone would tell me. Um, um, X, I think, means uh, the amount of hydrogen. Uh, so, so, uh, Professor Carabini, you should correct me if I'm wrong. Y means um, the amount of helium, and, and, and Z means everything else. <laughs> the they call it metallicity. Yep, yeah. yep. Whatever after helium is metal. Yep, yeah, yeah. And th by the way, if you get an astronomer and a chemist talking, the the chemist just 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 starts crying because astronomers <laughs> think think everything heavier than helium is a metal. If if you're an astronomer, boron is a metal. Nitrogen is a metal. Like when physics approximates, uh, mathematicians cry. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Differential simplification. Okay. Now, now, you were asking a really interesting question earlier. Um, I'm going to try to remember. It was about uh, uh, the abundance in our solar system, the abundance of elements in our solar system. I'm going to show you one, one graph, and we're going to see it again. In fact, we're going to see it several times. I'm going to show it a couple times, but let me at least show it to you now because it's quite interesting. These are the abundances in our solar system. This is actually a very old graph. Um, and here what we do is we say normalize everything to silicon equals 10 to the minus 10 to the 6. 10 to the 6 atoms, for example. Okay. So just multiply the graph up or down so that silicon here falls at 10 to the 6 or silicon. Okay. And then what are the abundances of all the other atoms relative to, to silicon? Okay. This is for, for our solar system. All right. Uh, let me show you a couple things. So first of all, what, what, what is this one way up here? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Lots of hydrogen. Where, where's all that hydrogen at? Helium. In the sun. In the, in the sun. The sun, yeah. Yep. Not, not a lot of hydrogen in Earth's atmosphere. For which I'm thankful because it's explosive. <laughs> um, let's see. What, what's this one here? Helium. Helium, yeah. He, also very abundant. Helium is, is very, very, very stable. Very stable. Okay. A couple other things uh, we want to look at. A um, few things I want to point out. First of all, notice that it's. See, see how it kind of follows this, this zigzag pattern? It's, it zigzags up and down, up and down, up and down. There's a reason for that, okay? See how there's a peak here, and a peak here, and a peak here, and a peak here? And if you squint a little bit, there are two, kind of maybe two peaks here squished together, right? These peaks occur in pairs. Anyone know why? Uh, decay. Decay has something to do with it. Oh. Decay does have something to do with it. Um, Notice that this peak is a little smoother, whereas this peak, see, a little, little smoother, and this peak is really jagged. Very sharp. Yeah, yeah, very sharp, right? Um, a couple other things we want to note. Um, somewhere around, uh, somewhere around iron or so, there's there's a lot of elements. Iron is pretty easy to make. Um, and by the way, this is mass number, so this is A. Okay, this is A, this is not Z, this is not, L. we can plot it as a function of Z, but here we plot A, okay? Um, that means uh, if I'm at, say, 12 here, carbon 12, this includes carbon 12, all the elements with a mass of 12, all the isotopes, okay? Um, another thing you want to note is, is hydrogen. This is a, a semi-log plot. Hydrogen is, is way up here at, at 10 billion. Okay, There's another thing I like about astrophysics. You get to say billion all the time. <laughs> whereas, whereas, you know, he, he, here we got things like, like maybe palladium and stuff over here. That, that's at you know, 10 to the minus 2 or something. Um, Mercury 196. I just did an experiment on Mercury 196, by the way. Very cool element, isotope. Okay. Now, a question for you is... is where do you think this comes from? How do you think we get this information? Light. Light is part of it. We, we, we can do spectroscopy on the sun, for example, and we can see 
because different elements glow or absorb radiation at different frequencies. Where else do you think we get all this? I, I'm willing to bet there's probably not a lot of mercury in the sun. There's probably not a lot of, uh, of europium and things in the sun. So the stack. Like the can rotation, I don't know how to explain it, of the, of the, of the earth. Like we're uh, taking a sample, like a cylinder of the, of a pair of rocks, for example, mm -hmm. and analyze every, every layer of the elements. Yeah, you, you're actually, you're actually um, just about right on. Uh, um, meteorites. In, in Italian, it's, uh, it is Carovaggio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Me meteorites have a lot of, you know, we, we say dirt, really, but, but that dirt generally comes from meteorites. Meteorites are generally very old. Okay, so, so when we look at this, when we look at the abundances of, of nuclei in the solar system, generally what we mean is the abundances when the solar system was formed. So, so just looking at the Earth is sometimes helpful, but if I wanted to look at, for example, the Earth, what, what if I take a mass of, of, of seawater and a mass of dirt, they're going to have different abundances, right? The Earth it doesn't mix very well. Okay. So meteorites are good because they're very old and they're like a snapshot in time. It's like looking at the elements frozen in time four billion years ago. Question so far? Yes. Uh, uh, does the abundance uh, number has to be a natural number? Uh, why there's uh, 10 to the minus 1 in the... Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a natural number. Um, so when I say, you know, the number of nuclei, really what we mean is the relative amount. So, so mm -hmm. ha half, half a kilogram of, of silicon, for example, and mm -hmm. 1.8 kilograms of something else. For, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Question? Why does the curve is smoother than the other? The one with the letter R. Yeah, why is this one smoother than the other? Yeah. You have to come back tomorrow and hear the oh, answer. Okay. <laughs> now, now you're excited, aren't you? Yeah. yeah so much. All right. Um, okay, just uh, let me cover just one more thing. Okay. Um, if I have, for example, carbon carbon 13, carbon 13 has, has um, six protons and seven neutrons. What would the mass of carbon-13 be? A little less than, uh, 13 times than six protons plus seven neutrons minus a little bit of uh, the energy uh, of the mass converted into energy for the bond. Okay. Wow, how did you know that? I am, my teacher uh, had us uh, studying nu nuclear physics uh, before the diploma. Oh, very good. You're exactly right. We um, also skipped uh, uh, the special relativity to study this. Okay. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. If I have an element with Z protons and, and N neutrons, if I add up the masses of the protons and the neutrons independently, it's actually going to be greater than, oops, let, 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 me, let me do this. It's actually going to be greater than the mass of that element, the mass of that isotope with Z protons and seven neutrons, okay? If I take six protons, seven neutrons, put them in a bowl, stir them up and bake them for one hour, and I get a carbon-12 nucleus, the mass of that carbon-12 nucleus is gonna be less for exactly the reason you said. Um, uh, it, 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 it's a relativistic term, okay? Where does that mass go? Energy. It goes into the energy. What energy? Of the bond. Yeah, the, the energy necessary to hold the nucleus together. Okay, so I think I will stop with that. We'll, we'll start with this tomorrow, but the mass of an isotope is not equal to the mass of all its protons plus mass of all its neutrons. It's greater than that. Where does that extra energy go? It goes into this quantity we call the binding energy. Okay? You've all heard MC squared, right? The binding energy is the difference in masses. Take the mass of all the components, subtract the nuclear mass. I call that the binding energy. For stable atoms, the binding energy is, is, is of course, greater than zero.
Okay. If it's unstable, then I have some extra energy and, and protons and neutrons can just fly off the atom. By the way, we can do experiments on, on atoms like that. Okay. Um, uh, let, let me be very careful here. This is the mass of the nucleus. If I want to look at the mass of an atom, what do I have to do? I have to add the electrons, right? The electrons have their own binding energy as well. Okay, so, so, so to figure out the mass of the atom, I have to take the mass of the nucleus plus mass of the electrons minus the electronic binding energy. Any ideas which one of these is larger? The nuclear binding energy, yeah, yeah. And, and, and we, 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 we see this in nature. Um, we've seen it in our, our, our technology, uh, some cases fortunately, some cases unfortunately. But, but the nuclear binding energy is much, 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 much larger than the electronic binding energy. Um, in, in many cases, uh, uh, millions of times larger. So much larger that we generally ignore the electron binding energy because it's so tiny compared to the nuclear binding energy. Okay, um, it's close enough to a uh, quarter after. So Professor Garabini said sometime, somewhere between six or 6.15. So I think we will stop for today and uh, plan on seeing you tomorrow. It's been a pleasure, thank you. Oh, the pleasure is mine. <laughs> One last question. Yeah. Uh, is it about that graph of the... That one? Is this pattern, overall pattern of uh, inverse proportionality related to this, uh, the number of uh, isotopes uh, in that chart? I, it's, it's like uh, as we go further off so the x-axis, uh, the number of uh, isotopes uh, gets bigger and bigger. Um, uh, it's not quite inversely proportional to that. There's actually other reasons for that, which we'll talk a little bit about tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Great question, though. Thank you.